There we go. Ryan and Amy made it. Good. Well, nice to see you guys. Hi, Micah. Micah's out in the vineyard again. Love that. Perfect. Hi, like Cheryl. Love it. Love it. I'm going to make Scott. sure I turn the chat on. We used a water pitcher to decant it, and it seemed like it worked pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> if you see uh, no sediment, something like that. Did you get that question from me? Oh, and that, that was totally, I mean, that was just me. Reading. Yeah, did you hear me, Carrie? I did, Harvey. Did okay, perfect, know? perfect. Wanted Harvey, to make sure. Did you the question? Oh, he's having trouble with his audio. Um, hmm. Well, so we'll ask him that again in a minute. But yeah, let's start with that. Sure. I think everybody's here. We can get so to the vineyard and then come back. Everybody is here. Welcome to happy hour, guys. Even though the world is imploding, we started this in COVID, and more than more than ever, we need a a little bit of happy in our in our week. I feel like. So um, we are thanks to Harvey Steinman for joining us. The um, he's been a food and wine journalist for. I don't know how many years. A lot. Um, Started in 1973. Wow. It's a, good, it's a lot a of good, things happened here. Year, year. <laughs> <laughs> um, and retired as uh, one of the editors of the of the Wine Spectator. So it is um, wonderful to have. We continue to bring different perspectives, and we're very glad to have him. And. I'm going to let mom talk about the why we made the food and wine pairing choices that we did today. Okay, so we have arrayas tonight today, which are um, keep talking. Okay, I got it. so I, I, we, I don't usually think of coat as a appetizer wine, but you know, happy hour we do appetizers. But then on the east coast they want dinner, so it kind of works both ways. So my daughter, Katie, um, when I was talking about recipes with her for coat, and she suggested, she said, you know, mom, coat always goes really, really good with lamb and those um, types of seasonings from um, the Middle East. So she suggested a reyes, and I've never made a reyes, so I said, sure, why not? So um, she stretches me, as we hope we stretch you every week, and um, I hope if you haven't made them that you get a chance to because, um, they're really pretty easy once you do it twice. Um, <laughs> well, Carrie made the pita bread. I did, by hand. The first time my pockets weren't so good, thank you. The second time, um, it was really simple, so. Yeah, but you can also make these with tortillas if you wanna make them a little easier uh, and kind of make the same process. So both are acceptable. Um, it's just that we're learning. Mine, mine is a tortilla. Uh, there's a tortilla. Here's a pita. See, my mom won't let me do things like that. She <laughs> makes me do everything 100% the classic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slave driver. Yeah. Um, it's only because her brother is making pitas and he's been doing it a while and he's really good at it. And so there's a little sibling rivalry in the family. What can we say? <laughs> Anyways, if you haven't tried these, uh, if you haven't tried them tonight, try them sometime. They are delicious. Mm -hmm. Really, really good. And I think they're good with a coat. Yep. And why did we pick the O4? Well, we, d we thought that um, an older vintage would work better with this, so we, uh, or a cooler vintage. So we, I talked to Harvey and we talked about the four, the 11, the 10, and he suggested um, he wanted to go back and revisit the four. So we picked the 04. This was a cool year in the vineyard. Um, at the time, it was the coolest year in record. Uh, still is. Yeah, still is. Or, yeah. No, 11 was a little cooler. But, um, it, it, in the cool year, as we've talked about in the past, uh, the vineyard, the flavor shift a little more towards the Bordeaux um, versus a little more ripe, like you'd expect from California. So a little more European in style. Um, it's, um, I really like this wine. It, at the time it was picked as the, um, by the uh, Seattle Met Magazine as the wine of the year. And then um, the vineyard was picked the same year as the vineyard of the year. So that was pretty cool. Um, and I hope if those of you are trying it, enjoy it. 
Yep. Ed says it's delicious. I agree, Ed. I like, you know, I like the the uh, the elevated. It, it's a little juicier than than some vintages. It's got this little crisp crispness going on that that balances the generosity, and uh, with the with the spices, very actually the spices aren't very strong, but they did add, they did add something to the the lamb, and the result is a nice little party in your mouth. <laughs> we like that. We need that. <laughs> That's perfect. So um, we do the vineyard tour next. I'm going to unmute Dad. <laughs> Hold on. All okay, right. I should be able to talk. You can talk. Okay, so in 2004, the report from the vineyard with the pool year was we knew it was cold the whole year and we dropped more fruit than normal. We went down to one cluster per shoot. Uh, across the board pretty much and um, it turned out that uh, we got the intensity even though it's on the cooler side of the spectrum and more the as Carrie mentioned the Bordeaux style then uh, today uh, I took some pictures up in the vineyard I don't know if Care wants some incidentally uh, Kathy has a little purple thing on her wrist you should wave that around you've already waved it mom and so Show them, yeah. She had a little crack in her wrist uh, last week in the just a, in little. Army, a little state industrial job. So you're gonna get muted if you talk that way, Dad. <laughs> I know she doesn't want to highlight that. Well, she waved it already. So, all right, what do you want to look at first, Cabernet or Syrah? Let's look at Syrah first. So, we've been following these vines along for the people that haven't been. We started out when the buds were dormant, then we went to bud swell, bud break, and then uh, when the shoots came up. And so on this, you can see uh, some of the clusters, there's some little brown things on there. And uh, the um, adjacent vines have got more progress through the flowering than this one particularly shows, but this is our Syrah vine that we're following for the year. So we'll just keep track of that. And then if you want to switch over to the cab, it's the same cab vine, same uh, position on the vine. And this um, close-up is an attempt to show the flowering of that cluster dead center. Uh, and I don't know, um, oh, I, did, was, okay, there, yeah, there's a the closer up backlit by the morning sun this morning. And you can see the difference between how the berries looked on the Syrah cluster and how these, this is full bloom. This is uh, one of the magic moments in the vineyard for a grower. And then we hope that all those turn in to berries and we have uh, lovely clusters for you. But um, that's the, the progress for the day up in the vineyard. We had a lot of wind uh, this spring, continued to have a wind event last, um, last Saturday, in some places got hail, we did not. And so we feel that we're still rocking things. And uh, we do, uh, this is a hallmark in the vineyard because you wanna have um, excellent irrigation, pre-bloom and post-bloom, and then you go into regulated deficit irrigation after this. And so we change what we're doing in the vineyard as well. That's it. We have any uh, vineyard questions before we mute Dad again? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks, Dad. Shoot, now I lost you. Dad, it's right here. Oh, there he is. You moved. Um. All right. So, uh, without further ado, we'll turn it over to Harvey. Okay. And. I assume you're going to go here, but I'm just going to preface. We have a lot of questions about how did you get into wine? What was your epiphany wine? How did you start writing about wine? So I assume you're going to cover that. If you ask me, I'll answer. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but you did want me to, uh, uh, to, to talk about how, wine spectator, how I did my tastings mm -hmm. when I was a spectator. And they pretty much do the same thing today. Uh, I'm going to need control of the, uh, I, I'm going to need share screen if, uh, if you want me to put some oh, pictures up. Yes, I do. Hold on one second. 
I forget that it doesn't. I have to remember how to do that again. Share screen. Well, give me one second and I will remember how to do it. While we're trying to figure that out, um, uh, I'll say that. There you go. You should have it now. Share screen. There we go. So, what do I need to do? There's a calendar. That's not what I want. Photos. Here we go. Share. Okay. Are you seeing something? You seeing me? Yep. Yep. You're great. Uh, so, uh, tasting process uh, for me has been pretty much the same. The, the, the advantage that I had with wines uh, since I started reviewing wines in 1973, but uh, the, the, the advantage that I had working at Wine Spectator was I had people to get the bottles and open them and pour them and clean up after me. So I didn't have to do all that, something that freelance wine writers absolutely do have to do. But I've always been a believer in tasting blind. I, I don't want to know who made the wine when I tasted it. Because I, I know people, and some of them I love, and some of them I don't. And I don't want that to, to, uh, to, to get in my way. So when I was tasting, um, I would know what the category of wine was and, and the vintage. So uh, I'm not dissing a wine for being too young or too old, but you know to, to know how old it is and, and, and what it represents. But basically, I don't want to know who made it. Uh, and we always, uh, let's see, as we, let's move on to the next thing here. Mm. I don't want the, the noise there. Okay, so that should stop. We always get a second bottle. And, and I've always tried to get a second bottle because stuff happens to a bottle. It could be corked. Uh, there could have been some pro problem uh, in, in the bottling. We want to make sure we're getting the best of the wine when, uh, when, when I taste it. Uh, so there's always a second bottle. Uh, when the bottles came in at Wine Spectator, they went into, by the way, that's Allison Knapp, just one of our, she was the tasting coordinator at one time. Now she's full-time writer. Uh, we keep them in, in the cellar, let them rest for a little while be before actually tasting them. Uh, and then put them for tasting into a coated bag. That way, uh, I'm, I'm tasting, a, I, I can't see the label. Uh, and if the bottle is very distinctive, we have the, the, our tasting coordinators are very good at decanting wine into another bottle. So uh, uh, a particularly heavy or a particularly colorful bottle doesn't, uh, I just didn't want to keep it blind. I wanted to know what's in the glass, not, uh, not anything else. So trying to be fair with all of that. Line them up, get ready to taste. Uh, when I tasted, it was, uh, in the, in the neighborhood of, uh, 15 wines in a, in a tasting. Uh, and then I was able to do four or five tastings a day. Uh, taking a break between each one and try to put like wines together into so that I'm, I'm tasting Cabernets and, and maybe Cabernets all from one vintage uh, and from one place uh, and so that I'm tasting like wines with like wines so I can make comparisons and as uh, as we taste the wine uh, we missed something here anyway we'll get to that in a minute uh, there were supposed to be some other pictures here that didn't come up, but, uh, the idea, <clears throat> the, 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 I, I sit in front of a computer and all I see is the code and, uh, the basic information about the wine, what vintage it is, uh, where generally where, where it's from, what color it's supposed to be. And, uh, and type in my tasting note and a rating and I can't see who, made the wine until after that rating is locked in. So I can't change the rating. Now I go back and change the tasting note if there's something that's particularly distinctive about it. Maybe it was better than usual or not as good. We usually didn't do that, but every now and then with important wines, 
we would. And that's pretty much how it works. And then it winds up uh, in the in the magazine or uh, or on the uh, website or in the app for people to to look it up. That's pretty much how I did it. Now you, I'm sure there's going to be some questions about all this, but that was how I did it when I was tasting. Now tasting for me was about uh, I would say about 25 to 35 percent. Of, of my work. The rest of the time I was writing stories, uh, tracking down information. Uh, and among the stories that I would do, some of them would be about wine. This is one I'm sure a lot of people in Washington remember from 2010. Uh, did, a, did just a general piece on what makes Washington, Washington. Uh, and the, got a lineup of about uh, seven or eight cover stories to give you an idea of uh, the kind of things that made it onto the cover. The cover says Australia's icon, but it was really all about penfolds and how they go about things. And it's really a, a pretty amazing uh, operation. When you get down to it, Ken Wright from Oregon, I do profiles of individuals. There's Christoph, uh, your neighbor on the other side of the state. And then I did a lot of stories on, about chefs. This was one of the first ones, Thomas Keller. I think that was in 2011 or 2012. Uh, tried to uh, look at chefs who are prominent, who, do, uh, who have made an impact in some way, have a story to tell, and also have a significant contribution involving wine. So Thomas Keller was one of them. Uh, Jose Andres, I did a piece on Jose Andres in 2012. I went to Japan to write about sushi. There's Jiro down in the corner. And I did a story on Anthony Bourdain just before he started on CNN. Uh, because uh, he had he'd made an impact. We all know now and you know, looking back on his life, what a, what a skyrocket he was and uh, how he really changed how we approach doing food and wine on television. And then uh, I think this, the next one, no, then I did, I did several stories. It's been a passion of mine from the beginning to look at what happens when you put food and wine together and what can we learn from it and how can we make better decisions about what to, what to choose uh, to drink and uh, what are the things we have to think about. So put that all together in, a, in one cover story. And there was another one that I'm, uh, I was very excited about Asian flavors, how, how we can drink Western wines with, with, uh, with Asian flavors, covered Chinese dishes, uh, Japanese dishes, Vietnamese dishes, Thai dishes, uh, and a little bit of India. And this is the last big profile I did. <clears throat> was it was uh, was this one? It says rich past price food as San Francisco's women chefs, but it was really about how women have really set the set the tone for the way we eat today. And I went all the way back to uh, the 1970s and uh, brought it up to today. It was a great story to do. I got great cooperation from the women chefs and the people involved, and uh, I'm very, very proud of that story. That's it. All right. Um, so we have a question on what regions did you cover? Uh, over the years, I have uh, written about just about every region in Europe and in the US. Uh, there was a time when Wine Spectator only did what we called, uh, we, we never tasted alone, is, is the way we used to do things until the early 90s. So in order to, uh, to do a story about Bordeaux or Burgundy or Piedmont or Tuscany, somebody from the US had to join our people in Europe so that we had two tasters. 
going on at the same time. And it was a great experience for both of us. I enjoyed tasting with Jim Suckling and Per Manson and, and uh, others uh, because we learn from each other. And we each, it's great to have two different palates addressing the same wine. And then you can get a, you get a better feel for what's, what's going on when someone else notices something that you don't and vice versa. So for, I've, I've been to Bordeaux to taste, I've been to Burgundy to taste, the Rhone, uh, Piedmont, Tuscany, various parts of Northeastern Italy. Uh, but in the early 1990s, we decided to, that we had to divide and conquer. We had to each, each take responsibility for a certain number of regions and divide the tastings. So I put my hand up for four regions. I wanted Washington, Oregon, Australia, and New Zealand, because I thought those are the regions that were coming up. Those are the regions that are going to be the most fun to write about for the next 20 or 25 years, as it turned out. And I was right. These were, I mean, the, to, to watch what was happening, to see them go from strength to strength, really home in on what they have to do to get the most out of their particular regions, to create a style, to, to create excitement. Uh, and it was, it was a, I'm, I'm glad I chose those. I mean, I could have, I was, I was, sorry. They're telling us there's gonna be a, another uh, lockdown tonight. Um, where was I? I, was, I put my hand up for those regions because I was excited about them. And I'm, I'm happy I did because uh, I'm a news guy. I, I started out in newspapers. Uh, I was a full-time journalist. I wrote sports before I wrote about food and wine. Uh, and I'm always interested in being the, the person who tells you about something before you hear it from anybody else, or at least you get it straight from me rather than from somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about, I hope. And the result, is, the result has been uh, 25 years of, of, of excitement for me writing about them and, uh, and getting to see the, the development happen. So how did you get into food and wine then? Uh, let's see, the short version of that story. I was a sports writer at the Miami Herald and my background, uh, my academic background actually is in music. I was a music major. And I went to the, I heard that the music critic was retiring. So I went to the managing editor and I said, you know, my academic background's in music. I'd like to apply for that job. He said, I wish you'd come in last week. I just hired somebody. However, I had been doing some restaurant reviews along with three other people on the staff. Uh, and he said, I like your restaurant reviews. Can you cook? And I lied and I said, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and he said, well, what we want to do, we, don't, we want to do something different. We want to do, we want to approach food with journalism. We don't want it to be just a bunch of recipes. We want you to write about people, write about what's going on, what's, what we should know about food. And I said, I can do that. And I said, all right, we'll try it for three months if it, if we like what you're doing and you like what you're doing, we'll keep doing it. And that was in 1973. And that's when I started. I got interested in wine through food. I, I never really paid a whole lot of attention, but I got, because I was reviewing restaurants and because I was talking to chefs and because I was talking to people who knew something about food, I learned something about wine along the way and I got fascinated with it. The Miami Herald, they wouldn't let me write Wine, a wine column. This is in the 1970s. I never could quite figure out why not. But when I moved to San Francisco to work for the San Francisco Examiner, I insisted that I'd be food and wine editor. So I could do both. Bob Thompson was writing, a wine, I don't know how many of you may have known Bob Thompson. He's still around, but he's not writing anymore. Uh, Bob was the regular wine critic. And I said, Bob, I don't want to stop your wine. I want you on there too. And let's just alternate. So for years we did, and then when I left the examiner to go to work for Marvin at the Wine Spectator, that was in 1984, 
uh, I stayed at Moines Spectator until I retired. So do you have any favorite or unique food and wine pairings that we should have? <laughs> <laughs> Just one. <laughs> uh, you know what? The, the, I discovered, and it's always great to discover uh, uh, something, something that really happens and it can happen consistently because it's a certain category that always works. A lot of people like champagne and caviar, for example. Um, I like light red wines, particularly Pinot Noir, but also Beaujolais with roast chicken. Just a simple salt and pepper, a little bit of herbs, roast chicken. Uh, but I think my favorite wine match is New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc with a Pacific Oyster. Yeah. It's that crispness and the combination of passion fruit and lime that it's a, it's a big characteristic with particularly Marlboro. Uh, the high acidity levels in that wine, uh, to me, that's magic and it always works for me. So you talked about the story you wrote about the Washington uh, style and you've yeah. obviously followed this industry for a long time. So how do you see Washington as emerging stylistically or have we yet? <laughs> I think a definite style has emerged. The way, I, the way I've always described it is that it's, it's fruit forward, but with, with more uh, structure uh, than, than we're accustomed to seeing in in, well, you, at least up until the more recent five years in California. And I, I think that it's, it had, it's this combination of sunshine and those very cold nights that, uh, that, that produces for me uh, something that is very distinctive. And it does, it's right across the board. It's in, it's in Cabernet, it's in it's Syrah. I love Washington Syrah. It's, I think, my favorite uh variety in, in in washington still is um you see it in the white wines and of course it's possible to manipulate that i mean if you're a good grower you can move the vineyard where you think it's going to produce the best wines and that's what you guys do at Cote bonneville and i love to see that when i can when i can discover it All right. and of course I've, I've stopped doing that now i, I handed uh, responsibility for the Pacific Northwest to Tim Fish and Marianne Warbeck is doing Australia and New Zealand now. So, a um, couple different kinds of questions. Uh, there was one, how are wines selected or chosen for review? What is the difference between 91, 94 points? Like, how does the scale work? <laughs> <laughs> what else do I have? Well, I mean, uh, let's let's take those two. Uh, the the uh, over the year we used to take whatever came over the transom, and then what if we didn't see everything uh, that we wanted to see? Important producers hadn't sent their wines in. Pick up the phone and call them and say, "Hey, you know, we're doing our we're wrapping up the year of tasting on this on on your region. If you want to get your wine in, uh, we need to have it by X date." Uh, and for the most part, I mean, there were a few people who just didn't want to send their wines in. For the most part, uh, we got, particularly in, in up and coming regions, which is what I was dealing with, everybody wanted to have their wines tasted. And then it got to be too much. I mean, there, there's so many good wines in the world. Uh, we could probably taste 50,000 wines and not uh, break, you know, not, not really get too deep into the iceberg. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there's a limit to how much even a, a big team can do. So a few years ago, uh, they, we, we decided at Wine Spectator, we're gonna have to have each producer let us know the wines they want to send us, and we'll tell them if we want them or not. And uh, we still taste almost 20,000 wines. They're still doing that. But it's it's a lot of wine. It's a it's and we don't want to have so much wine that you can't really spend time on it. We don't want to just blow through 150 wines in a day and call that tasting. Yeah, because you can definitely taste 150 wines in a day, but you can't you can't spend any time with them and give them a fair shake. And you can't write a tasting note that people are going to understand. Otherwise, all the tasting notes look the same. 
Mm -hmm. Right. For sure. So then well, the, the other question was the difference between the, 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 the old hundred point scale problem. <laughs> yep. Uh, um. it, it, look, I, I think of it as really simple. I mean, if, if you say yes or no to a wine, that's a two point scale. Mm -hmm. If you say, I like this wine better than this wine, how do you express the difference? They're both yeses. Uh, so you have to divide it up a little bit. And it's just a matter of how far you want to divide it. Uh, it's, it, my feeling is the way I always approached it, and I think this is how most of our tasters at Wine Spectator still do it. Basically, if it's 90 or above, that's an outstanding wine. It's, it's something that you think is, is, is going to be outstanding. And we don't know the price when we taste it. I, ne I never, knew, I, when I was tasting at Wine Spectator, we never knew the price, and I believe that's still the case. All you know is where it came from and what vintage it is and what the, what the uh, varietal component is supposed to be or what the type is supposed to be. And I think that's good because at 90 points means it's an outstanding wine. It doesn't matter if it's, it's a $5 wine or a $500 wine. Is it outstanding? And then the, the next question is, how outstanding is it? Is it, if you have 10 outstanding wines, are there two that are almost exactly equal in terms of quality? Then they get the same score. If there's one that's a little bit less, not quite up to, doesn't quite have all of the things you're looking for. That's a little bit less. Something that's a little bit more gets a little more. So it's a, it's, it's a gradual scale. But basically, if it's over 90, it's outstanding. If it's over 95, it's classic. Between 90 and 95, it's just a reflection of how good we think the wine is within that range. If it's 85, it's a good wine, but probably not something you want to get too excited about. Let's hope it's not more than about 10 bucks or 15 bucks. So then how do you rate vintages? Yeah, that's, a, that, that's one that, that, that people get very confused about. When we look at a vintage, we look at how many outstanding wines there are from among the ones we tasted. If that percentage is very high, it's probably going to get an outstanding rating. Now, the question is how many really good wines you can expect to find from that vintage? And are they, are they likely to be great wines? It's, uh, it's a guess. It's always a guess because I've been fooled. Many times we all have, and uh, I've I've thought, boy, this is going to be a great vintage. And ten years later, you think, oh well, that didn't work out so good. <laughs> and you think that, that uh, you know you taste the wines through that vintage, and there's a lot of disappointing wines. Uh, interestingly enough, I've never really had that problem in the Pacific Northwest with either Oregon or Washington. The wines show what they are across the board. I've found pretty, pretty consistently. If it, uh, you know, some vintages are more tannic than others, how much do you like tannin? I mean, you have to figure out how, how everything balances. And I made my judgments based on how many good wines I found in a particular vintage. Okay. And then now, how do you, how do you uh, tell if the wine mike wants to know how and when can you tell if a wine is going to be great in 10 plus years like how do you come up with that drinking drinking window experience i mean the one of the advantages to having tasted wine since 1973 is that i've got a lot of i've got a lot of in the memory bank i've tasted the wines when they were young tasted the same wines older not every wine obviously but representative wines and I know what, in a particular region, what, what has to balance and what has to come together to make a wine age. I've learned, one of the things I learned in the last 15, 20 years is that Washington wines age better than I thought they would. I, you know, I, I thought, okay, here's a Cabernet. It's got great structure now. It's got terrific fruit. The balance, the balance is good. The length is, 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 is tasting and it's delicious. How long is this going to last? Generally, I, I would give, I would say five to eight years. It would be the, you know, for good wines. Some wines have the goods to go longer than that. 
And it turns out a lot of Washington wines do. The, the, the case in point is this one. This is 2004, right? Mm -hmm. 16 years old. I think I said drink by 2013 or something like that, or 2018 or, or 2015. I don't know. It's still drinking fine today. And it's, it's what I find is if the balance is there, the fruit will keep, will stay. If the balance is off in some way and either too acidic, not acidic enough, uh, intrusive tannins or rough tannins, uh, intrusive tannins and rough tannins don't usually go away. So I, I will mark down the wine and will probably tell you to drink it in a medium range rather than a long range. I'm looking for balance for a wine to age. So um, before we leave the points thing completely, what is a hundred point wine in your mind? Well, I can't find anything at all that I would want better about it. And I think in my, in my history, I think I've given five or six hundred point scores. Yeah, they're, um, and, and then while we're on aged wines, June had a question about sediment on the cork. And I heard that question, yeah. Sediment on the cork is, as I would think, if we're talking about, well, first of all, you're going to get sediment on the cork if the wine is lying down and the cork is lower than the rest of the wine, which is a proper way to store wine. Uh, and if the sediment is dark sludge, that's not a problem. Just wipe it off and decant the wine. And you might have to filter some of it out. I, when I decant older wines, <clears throat> uh, I decant the wine until you start seeing the, the sludge come up in, in, un, under the, in, into the neck of the bottle. Stop. If there's a, a lot of wine left in the bottle, I'll pour it through a coffee filter. Just that separately in the coffee filter and then taste that. If that tastes good, I'll just pour it in with the rest of the wine. Um, so I don't want to waste any wine. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's good wine, yeah, why waste it? Yeah. Um, then Adrish asked, do you visit? No, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Gary. I, I, the, the other half of that question, if it's just tartrate crystals, just wipe them off. Oh, yeah. So you get tartrate crystals on the, on the, on the cork. Mm -hmm. So that's just those little, those little glassy crystals, just wipe them off. Um, so do you visit vineyards and taste fruit as well as part of your reviewing yeah. slash journalistic process? For the journalistic process, not for the reviewing. I mean, I'm only reviewing what's in the glass. And that I should put this all in past tense because I don't do this for a living anymore. Um, but I do love to visit vineyards with the people who grow the grapes or who make the wines from them, preferably both because it's the best way to understand why the wine is what it is. And I've been in some great vineyards uh, in, uh, in the world, uh, Romani Conti. I've been in, in uh, uh, the vineyards that make Grange. Uh, there, there's something special about those vineyards. And when you, if you happen to be there when the grapes are ripe, just before they pick them or when they're picking them, that is when you can really get the handle on it. Because uh, I've, I, I see your dad grinning over there. <laughs> well, that's why we did the, uh, the pre-harvest party when we did, so that yeah. we could give up. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, I remember, being in the vineyard, and the name of the vineyard is, is, is escaping me at the moment, which is the core vineyard for Grange, with Peter Gago and the then vineyard manager. Uh, walking through the vineyard, they were probably going to pick it later that week or early the next week. And we sampled grapes in, in a few places. And damned if the fruit character in that, in, in the, these are, 125 year old vines that, and then, and they were producing, they did not replanted, grown in their own roots in sandy soils. Uh, tasting that grape, I could taste what the wine was going to become. The fruit character was there. 
the sense of balance in the wine was there. Yeah, now it's going to get fermented. It's going to go through malolactic fermentation. Uh, there's going to be fining. There's going to be a, you know, who knows what along the way. But the essence of the wine was right there. And that was, that was where I really understood why that wine was what it was. Excellent. Um, Paul asks about corked wines. How often did you run across corked wines in your tastings? We kept, we kept track. And by the way, one of the good regions we had two bottles of each wine was that if we suspected cork taint in the first wine, we had another bottle that could be opened out of our site and brought back and we could compare them. Uh, and what I learned about cork taint over the years is that it doesn't have to be blatant to be, to be present. Sometimes you can just sort of clip the wine. And when you, when you taste the wine, this is, well, this, not a, not a great finish here, not a lot, not much expressiveness. Give it a medium rating because it's still drinkable, it's still pretty good. Uh, and then when you take the bag off after locking in the score, you realize that's a wine that has a track record. You, sus you immediately suspect cork taint. When cork taint is obvious, it's, it's obvious, but when it's at, at a level like that, it could just manifest itself as kind of clipping the wine a little bit. And so that's why we have the second bottle, put it in another tasting and it'll get the better score and the better re review. And I would like to interject having had a bottle of wine with Harvey that was slightly, very, very low threshold level of TCA. My threshold's pretty low, but his is exceptionally low, which is great as a reviewer because it means it's more fair for us as wine. Yeah. Right more fair for you guys. But um, yeah, if you ever want to test your, your TCA threshold, have a glass of wine with Harvey. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thoughts on different closures and impact on aging, especially uh, having reviewed Australia and New Zealand who are leaders in the... Uh, in the uh, I am a huge believer in, in uh, closures such as the, the twist off, uh, the glass, uh, the glass stopper basically work on the same principle. It's just a little plastic seal uh, that's held in place. Um, the um, and in uh, in terms of aging, and, and there are other possibilities. And, and the the technical cork to me is great for wines that you're going to drink within five or ten, maybe ten years. But I don't know what the what the longer term aging potential is of it. I think they're still working on that, and uh, certainly I have run across very very little cork taint from the technical corks. Uh, as far as aging, uh, I've tasted the wines in Australia that were bottled under the first version of the screw caps. They call them Stelvin caps there because Stelvin company was the first one to do it. And I, at the time that I tasted these wines, they were 25 years old in the bottle, still drinkable, still fresh, but there was also extra layer. I mean, these were not really good wines because they were, they were putting under these Stelvin closures. They were just meant to be everyday drinking wines. But 25 years later, you could still drink an everyday drinking wine. And it had developed those extra characters that you that you want in uh, in an aged wine, and my experience tasting outstanding wines, ageable wines in Australia, in my own from my own cellar, in my own tastings, is I'm a firm believer that that's the best way to do it. Some people say, well, they never age. Well, they do. What they do is they never lose their fruit. I like fruit. I want to have the other stuff going on with it, but when a wine loses its fruit, to me, okay, that's when you stop drinking it. It's only a curiosity. Oh, we have a bunch of people asking for favorite wineries and favorite wineries in Australia. Um, <laughs> Look at my ratings. I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, I know it's not really fair to say favorites, but those guys are still good. Um, look at look at Mary Ann's rating. She's good. Yeah. Now, Tony says, what would your comment, what would, 
your comment be if Grange went to screw cap? But my understanding is a lot of wineries in Australia, there are screw cap in the Australian market and they bottle under cork to come to the US market. It depends on who their importer is. If, they're, if they have an importer that is open to screw caps, I prefer twist offs because screw cap didn't, didn't sound nice. But whatever it is, it's, it is what it is. Uh, some importers are skeptical about being able to sell the wine if it doesn't have a cork in it. And uh, I think we're, we're, we're slowly getting past that. I don't, I don't think the, the onus is there, or the, 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 the bad vibe is there with, with, except for old people who are older than me. I think, or or snobs who really haven't really looked at what the what the truth is. The truth is the wines, the wines under screw cap are great and they age well. I remember there was a tasting, there was an experiment they did at AWRI, which is the Australian Wine Research Institute, in which they looked at fifteen different types of closures from corks, screw caps, glass tops, all that stuff. It was a white wine. And uh, they were bottled into these different closures and kept at in, in normal conditions. They didn't try to keep them too cold or to make them get too warm or whatever. And I forget whether it was five years or 10 years, but I remember we ran the picture of all of these wines lined up and you could see the difference in color. The only wine that still looked like it did originally was the wine under screw cap. And when they tasted these wines blind, the screw cap was the preferred wine, always. So, I mean, I, I got sold on it very early on and I understand what the marketing considerations are, but in terms of what happens to the wine over time, uh, I've never had a problem opening an older bottle that had a screw cap on it. Now, you did, you did mention Grange. Grange is the only wine I believe it is still the only wine in the Penfolds uh, production that is still bottled under cork. But they do recorking clinics around the world for anybody who buys Grange. So you can get your, your bottle, you can bring your bottle, they'll taste it. If it's okay, they'll top it up with more of the same vintage and put a new cork in it. But, uh, and they still do those, they come every, three to five years, or they do go to all around the world to do it. Uh, and it's because Grange has made, I mean, I've done several verticals of every vintage of Grange up until that particular date. First vintage was 1951. Uh, and I remember a tasting would have been around seven or eight years ago. And I've never had a bad bottle of Grange. 50, even the 51, still absolutely delicious, still had that fruit that I talked about. Maybe not as powerful, but it was still there. The wine was beautiful. As long as the cork survives, the wine does. It's an amazing wine. All right, so what's one of your funniest stories about tasting? <laughs> you know, lighten things up. Wait. Other than the many times I missed the spit bucket. <laughs> uh, uh, you didn't prime me with that one. I, I, that's something I should really think about. Oh, I because, didn't? Oh. No, yeah, didn't. Funniest, last funniest, funniest wasn't there. Maybe, uh, maybe you sent me an email and I didn't see it this afternoon. Um, taste, funny, t oh, well. Uh, well, I, if this isn't a tasting on me, it's a, it, it, but it's what can't come to mind, so I'll tell the story. I'm tasting at Wine Spectator, and Jim Lobby is tasting in the next room. And uh, Jim makes, uh, makes a comment, I'm tasting Australian wines. It's a, and it's, it's a Shiraz's, and then there's going to be like a, a mixture of, of Grenache and other varieties going all the way down to some sweet wines at the end. And he says, 
oh yeah and they say california has some high alcohol wines what are you doing there uh so yeah i pulled pulled one of their Shiraz and looked at it and it said, yeah, 14.3%. That's a little bit, that's fairly high. And then as the day went on, I started tasting some of the other wines and we got to, I got to some Chardonnays and the Chardonnays are coming in at 12.9, 12.5. Rieslings are coming in at 12.5, 12.1. Um, and then at the very end, there were some Moscatos, and those those were like five and a half percent. So I said, "Yep, those are your high alcohol Australian wines." <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, laugh, so that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, as a news guy, what are some of your favorite discoveries, area by area? Area by area. What are just some of your favorite discoveries over the over the years? Um, I, the story I like, to, uh, one story I like to tell is uh, the phone call I got early one morning, <clears throat> I think it was 1980, no, 1998, uh, this very heavily French accented voice said, oh, me, I have something you need to see. Who is this? He says, it's, it's, my name is Christophe and I planted, I, I planted a vineyard on rocks. It's amazing. You've got to see it. So I said, okay, yeah, I've got a pretty full schedule here, but if I, I can meet you at 8.15 tomorrow and I'll have until 10. So he picks me up in his pickup truck, uh, takes me out to Walla Walla. I was in Walla Walla. He takes me out to the Walla Walla vineyards. Uh, didn't have an appellation then. Uh, and he shows me his three vineyards that he has planted. And they've got rocks in them the size of my fist. It looked like Chateau Neuf de Pop. Uh, and I said, uh, I said, you know, how long is it going to take for these things to grow in this? And he says, I don't know. I think we're going to have a vintage next year. Uh, and I, I think I dropped in a paragraph or two about, about him in, in the annual report. And then the wine started to appear. And as you know, they were not like anybody else's. There was something very distinctive about them. Uh, and they were really compelling wines right from the get go in these baby vines that were about as high as my computer, uh, in rocks. And, uh, and of course they were planted on their own roots. So, uh, it, it only took two years to get some fruit and we know that story. Uh, so it was, it was great that he wanted to share that with me. And, uh, and I took a chance that it, uh, this could be a waste of time, but it turned out not to be because it's one of the most compelling terroir stories in America. All right. Any varieties, grape varieties that you think are underappreciated, perhaps blending grapes you think could stand on their own more often? I wish I could call them all to mind. Uh, there's, I mean, there, uh, one of the things I loved about visiting Italy and visiting vineyards in Italy was that there are so many different grape varieties that you never heard of or are only beginning to hear of or you will hear of in, in the next few years. But I remember being in Northeastern Italy and tasting Ribola Java for the first time and, uh, and thinking, well, oh, never had anything quite like this. Um, Picolit, uh, I mean, I think the, the problem, it's not a problem, but the thing we have to remember is just because it grows well in one place doesn't mean it's going to grow well someplace else. And just because it makes good wine in one place doesn't mean it's going to make good wine someplace else. It takes, it, it takes time to, to, to figure it out. And uh, I'm, I was particularly delighted to see over the last 10 years or so in my writing about wine, how much experimentation was going on. Yeah, I think that's one of, well, especially the regions that you, that you raised your hand for and chose to, to highlight. Mm -hmm. um, that's the fun part is there is more 
experimentation and there is more discussion. People are yeah. doing different things. Well, and you know, the, the downside though of the regions that, uh, that I've been writing about or that I was writing about is that they're new regions and they had to prove what they had with grapes that everybody knew. So there isn't, there aren't any weird grapes in, uh, in, in Oregon or Washington. There, there, is, there are now, people are, are experimenting with things. But over the years, I mean, most people dismissed Oregon as, as, the, as Pinot Noir and nothing else. And Washington was hard for them to get a handle on. Uh, but it was a limited number of grapes. And uh, what, what's exciting is there, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a great disappointed, a great disappointment to me that Syrah never caught on as well as I wished it would. Mm -hmm. Because I think it, Washington makes a great Syrah. Well, Adrish agrees with you, for sure. We know that, although he stepped away from his computer for half a second. And he's yep. back. And he's back. <laughs> Did you hear that, Adrish? I, I lauded, uh, he's, his, he's muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, Adrish, I, 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 I lauded how, uh, how great Washington oh. Syrah is. Oh, <laughs> yep, I, I agree. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah. We have some people who are having to take off because we're at our hour. Do we have any other questions? Or are we going to let Harvey, I don't know what your schedule is tonight, Harvey. Um, we don't want to keep everybody too long. But um, are there any other questions? I have to go pick up some fish. Okay. No, you're, and I've, I've got to explain that. Um, <laughs> there's a, there is a, a service that's uh, been going for only a short time. I think it started last year called Sea Forager here in San Francisco. And it's a, uh, it's a, a fisherman, a, a, a fisherman who wanted to stay at home more than having to go out. And he got all of his buddies, he and his wife got all of their buddies who go out and fish San Francisco uh, waters from Half Moon Bay all the way up to Marin County uh, and create, uh, the, 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 it's kind of a CSA for fish. Every week, we uh, they they select a selection of fish, uh, and uh, we get a pound or two, depending on how much uh, you order. And today it's going to be fresh petroleum sole right out of the water, so we've got to go up and get it. So, what are you going to add with that? Yeah, how are you going to cook it, and what are you going to drink with it? I'll just probably bread it with panko and 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 uh, give it a quick saute and squeeze some lemon on it, maybe some capers. What? <laughs> no, that's not what you're doing. Well, they will look into the door. Carol's telling me. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, tell they Carol I'm glad she liked the arrays, even though she wasn't planning on it. That's fantastic. They have, an, uh, the Sea Forager has a network of places where they drop the fish off in coolers. So the one nearest to us is about a four minute drive up the hill from, from where I live. open the cooler and your bag of fish has your name on it. You grab it and, uh, and bring it home. And it's available between five and six. There's kind of a spy-like quality to it that I kind of like, spycraft quality to it. <laughs> so do you have a wine picked up? Uh, actually, no, I didn't. <laughs> but I think this Cabernet is gonna be just fine. <laughs> It goes with everything. I know. Cabernet and white. Sure. No, I... <laughs> oh, it, was right. okay with, it was okay with all the, all the spices in the, in, the, in the lab. It should be fine. Yeah, absolutely. There you go. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. We'll let you get to your, uh, your spy fish mission. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yes. I know the secret word. And I think next week. Well, every... Oh, yeah. No, I was just going to say, I, I, I wish I'd been able to interact individually with, with more of you, but uh, maybe next time. Yeah, yeah, next time. Well, you'll have to come back, because depending on how long we're, uh, we're doing this. <laughs> it's always time for happy hour. A couple weeks, you know, that's what we set out to do. Yeah, <laughs> so 
Next week is the, um, I've got a geologist friend coming. So if you guys want, because somebody asked, uh, a couple of you have asked more about the geology of the vineyard in Eastern Washington in general. And so I figured George is more of an expert than I am. And uh, so he is going to talk to us. I think he's got a paper. We're supposed to do some homework ahead of time. So I'm a little worried, but um, if, <laughs> it'll be, uh, it'll be interesting and it'll be fun. So uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. And again, thanks for, thanks for joining us, everybody. Yeah. Thanks so much, Harvey. Thanks, Harvey. Have a great night, guys. Yep. Cheers. Oh, yeah. It was great. It was great. Yeah.